stay hungry, stay foolish. Friends matter to us and they matter more than we think. The single most surprising fact to emerge from the medical literature over the last decade or so has been that the number and quality of friendships we have has a bigger influence on our health, our happiness and even our mortality risk than anything else except smoking. Our guest is world-renowned psychologist and author who famously discovered Dunbar's number, how our capacity for friendships is limited to around 150 people. In today's book, he explores the ways different types of friendships and family relationships intersect and the complex of psychological and behavioral mechanisms that underpinned friendships and make them possible and just how complicated the business of making and keeping friends really is. Working at the coalface of the subject at both research and personal levels, he has written the definitive book on how and why we are friends. It is a great pleasure to welcome Robin Dunbar. Robin, welcome to the show. A pleasure. There's a saying in innovation, Robin, and it is that innovation happens at the intersections. And when I thought about you and this book, I thought, firstly, this book is all your culmination of all your work, all your studies, all your books in the past coming together to create this intersection. But you too are one of those people who have multiple backgrounds. You're a polymath of sorts and have an intersection of backgrounds. I thought a great way to start would be with that and to show how the collision and the intersection of so many of your disciplines has led to the unique view of the world that you have. I do indeed have a very checkered career. I, I, I actually started out with aspirations to be a philosopher, but I pretty soon discovered uh, that philosophy was just too difficult. It's for the clever folk. And um, uh, one could get on uh, much more easily and in some ways, in much more interesting ways by um, leaping into science and, and becoming a scientist. But I hasten to say, you know, one of the big lessons I learned from uh, doing philosophy as, a, as an undergraduate degree was to ignore everybody else's disciplinary boundaries and, and really try to, to see the big picture and pull all the different uh, disciplines together. So my career has really uh, been um, half a century of doing just that. Um, uh, uh, I've spent about half my time in psychology departments doing psychology, if you like, and half my time in zoology or biology departments doing ecology, evolutionary biology, genetics. So uh, we span the whole whole spectrum. And then beyond that, you know, my, I've always had an interest in history. So a lot of my projects have involved collaborations with historians, collaborations with uh, literature people, um, uh, people work in drama, um, uh, as well as, um, you know, really weird people like physicists and mathematicians at the other side of the, the universe. So it's been great fun doing that. With that in mind, Robin, let's share how this book came about, because you said in the book, like many ideas in science, this book and the story it has to tell is a personal odyssey, and it came about by accident. And this is the beauty of such a multifaceted background, such a polymathic background, that you spot things in such a unique way. I'd love if you shared how this book came about. Well, I suppose in many ways, it's an attempt by me to pull together uh, a very long, scattered, disparate research career with, with a number of separate strands, but always strands leading towards the same big question, if you like. But one of the problems with, with science, as we practice it these days, is you end up writing these very short focused papers it's scattered all over the place in different journals. And, you know, the, the journals themselves are discipline specific. Uh, people only read the, if they read anything at all, the journals from their particular end of the discipline, their particular sub-discipline, if you like, and they ignore all the rest. So uh, I began to feel that it, the the kind of big picture was just being lost here in, in this scattered 
kind of um, flotsam and jetsam of papers uh, distributed all over the uh, publishing universe. And it probably would be very helpful if I could draw it all together and show how it all related to each other and, and why we went from one particular point uh, to another in the course of this attempt to understand, in the end, if you like friendships, but it's kind of built around a focus on social evolution there. Why is it that we and our primate cousins, the monkeys and apes, live in these very complex social systems, which are cognitively very demanding. Um, we need big brains to handle them. Uh, um, they're very sophisticated. Uh, they're very complex and very complex to study. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of still, if you like, an unanswered question in many ways as to why these complex systems evolve, because obviously not all other forms of life live in such complex social systems, not even all the, the other mammals. Many of the mammals live in very simple uh, social systems, perhaps just a pair breeding together like foxes do and, and, and many of the smaller antelope, uh, perhaps kind of loose herds which don't have any structure. Primates have these very odd things which are effectively friendships. I mean, realistically, when you watch primates in the wild, it's very obvious that these are kind of bonded relationships of the kind we have with our friends and family, very much the same. So my background originally was really in studying primates in the wild, where I cut my teeth and spent the first half of my career wandering around bits of Africa, uh, uh, following groups of monkeys here and there, and groups of antelope as well, to be, uh, uh, broaden it out a bit. Um, but the second half has really come around to focus on humans. You know, why is it, you know, what is the nature of human sociality? What's peculiar about it? So it, was, it really required me to kind of take a very, very big, broad picture, um, trying to pull together one end, things like the genetics and ecology of, of social systems, but at the other end, the nitty gritties of how individuals relate to each other and what friendships are for what benefits they have for you there's so many places i could go there but i, I you mentioned your observations of primates for example and, and you reminded me of a beautiful story you tell just to show how social and how intelligent animals are you mentioned the great story of the two sisters grooming the mother's hair i'd love you to share this just to show the the depth of your observations well, it, it kind of is a, 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 um, an object lesson in itself, actually, because at the time when this was happening and I was taking a photograph of it happening in the, the sort of remote mountains of northern Ethiopia many, many years ago, I didn't actually appreciate what was going on. It was only when I saw the slide afterwards, after it being developed and, and so on, that I actually realised um, how interesting it was. But what it showed was... Uh, a, a very typical everyday uh, morning session of grooming that the animals have before they set out to, to go and uh, forage for food. Um, they groom in their little groups. Uh, parents groom with their, their, their offspring or uh, females groom with their sisters in, in the group and so on. Uh, and here you had a mother with her head down on the ground and her, her back end sticking up in the air while her two daughters uh, a younger one and an older one, uh, were busy uh, at, at her rear end. And it was the little one that was grooming uh, her, the fur of her uh, backside uh, most assiduously. But what I noticed the older sister was doing, who was kind of just about on the verge of becoming an adult, she was sort of uh, about puberty age, um, was uh, she'd got a hand behind her sister's little sister's head and was pushing her very quietly and carefully away. And her head was sort of tucked down watching her mother's face uh, at the other end, as it were. So she was very conscious of the fact that if the little sister had objected in some way or the mother had turned round and seen what was going on, she would have got a flea in her ear from, from, from her mother for being so mean, as it were. <laughs> um, uh, whereas uh, if she could sort of do this surreptitiously and persuade the little sister to 
back off. She could take over grooming. And so when mum turned around to uh, the end of the grooming session, mum would notice it was her that was doing <laughs> the grooming and, and uh, she would get all the credit, if you like. Uh, but, and, and her, her, her uh, the, the subtlety of it is really of how uh, she understood the behaviour not only of her mother but also of, of, of her um, uh, juvenile uh, sister that you know if she pushed her quietly enough out of the way she'd probably wander off and go and play with some of the other kids around about and not make a fuss which actually from my notes was exactly <laughs> what happened you know so life in Life in primate social groups, monkey and ape social groups, is very human in that sense. And, and it has is just full of these subtleties and complexities. It made me think of like a, a psychological game of Jenga where you're trying to push the piece out without being seen. Yeah. And then it made me think of how in organizations some people try to take the credit for other people's work. There was so much yeah. in that piece. But I, I wanted to reverse to a piece, um, and it's it's slightly off topic, but I think it's so important. And why I mentioned your diverse background and your connecting of all the dots of all the knowledge that you've you've gleaned over the years. Because I often think about this as a huge problem, not only in society, but in innovation and in organizations where you have people very tightly swimming in their swim lane of knowledge. And when knowledge is almost, we're overloaded with knowledge in these days where knowledge is freely available, we need more people to think across the swim lanes and connect the dots. And I thought, while it's not part of this book, it's cer certainly something that you are a huge advocate of and an evangelist of, and I'd love to share your thoughts on that, perhaps. I, I, well, I think the... the, the um... The evidence, if you like, is is uh, overwhelming that um, uh, creativity comes from being able to look over the parapet of your particular little corner uh, of the battlefield of the world, as it were, and see what everybody else is doing. And in doing so, you invariably get a different perspective, or at least if you have the right mindset to, 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 to think about these things in the right way, then very often you can see a, a novel dimension and the history of the de development of science over the last, I don't know, a uh, couple of thousand years or so is just full of classic examples of that, you know. So the, my favorite example of this is um, the origins of the modern atomic theory of chemistry, which has been with us for the better part of uh, 200 plus years now. Um, and is really the foundation of modern chemistry. And that, that was invented by an accountant, would you please? <laughs> Anton Lavoisier, who, who, who was in charge at the time of um, the, the French uh, uh, munitions uh, factory for, for, for the French, French government. And uh, in trying to improve the quality of gunpowder, he, he developed what was effectively um, the um, uh, modern atomic theory of chemistry and, and sort of trounced in many ways the, the existing theories, which were largely the product of, of um, some very reputable scientists here in Britain. Um, of course, it didn't do him any good because he still ended up on the guillotine in the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get. That's what you get for innovating. Absolutely. But as somebody, one, some, one of the, the sort of uh, intellectuals in Europe commented when they heard that he'd been guillotined, simply because he was, you know, part and parcel of the the um, uh, French monarchy's administrative structures. They hadn't done anything particularly anti-revolutionary during the, during the French Revolution. But they said, you know, with the loss of that head, uh, basically we've lost, you know, the future of European science <laughs> uh, pretty much. You know, he was the smartest man in, on the planet and, and, and these idiots <laughs> uh, uh, killed him. <laughs> And we are all the losers, right? So, you know, it's just a kind of reminder that in the end, you know, having a different perspective is very important. I think you see that in kind of innovation type environments where if you've got a mix of people from different backgrounds, different coming in at a problem from different disciplines, um, if they can work together, and that's the key to it, because the great risk is they get each of them, each of us gets on our high horse, attempts to defend our particular corner on the grounds that it's completely correct and everybody else must be only half correct. Um, but if we can kind of get over that and, and uh, 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 listen to what others are, are suggesting and saying to us, 
um, then very often, you know, out of the blue smoke comes something really innovative and, and novel that will change the whole future of um, whatever area you happen to be working, whether it's, let's say, advertising or, or science or medicine or, or whatever. Beautifully articulated, Robin. I was thinking about something you, you talked about in the book and you mentioned about how social the species were. And I thought it was really interesting, the ratio of, of head size to body size as well. Maybe we'll get into that. But I, I really found it interesting how taking on, building on what you just said, the idea of this getting on together is absolutely core to the, the survival of the species, really. And it was a lesser known Darwin quote about it's, it's about collaboration of the species, not just the fittest. And I often take that out of your work, that that is so important. But I was interested to, to, when you talked about, say, the foxes you mentioned earlier, but also like the mountain goats who will go off on their own, uh, you know, path. And, and while antelope that you studied, they will work together as a herd. And the herd mentality actually makes, for example, I could be off wandering and I go, hey, look, there's fruit, there's ripe fruit over here. And I can call the rest of the herd that that mentality is so core for the survival of every species. Yes, yeah, so uh, this is true in general. Um, you know, sort of most of successful evolutionary developments in many ways have involved cooperation in some form. I mean, the most basic form of cooperation is simply the mating pair that, that you know, collaborate to rear offspring. I'm, you know, I'm talking about sort of everyday garden birds like sort of robins and tits and, and albatrosses and, and uh, indeed, you know, many of these smart birds like parrots and, and uh, crows and stuff, they're all pair bonded. And that pair bonding is a collaboration between two individuals who aren't related to each other particularly uh, for the production, successful production of offspring. So it's not just a case of um, uh, uh, an egg uh, uh, meeting a sperm, as it were, and producing a baby. You've got to rear the, the, the thing uh, up to adulthood so that it reproduces in turn. That's the sort of evolutionary uh, imperative, if you like. So those species which um, have developed these collaborative arrangements tend to be the smarter species and also the lineages which are historically the most successful. And among those in the mammals, at least, you know, the primates in many ways come out top. I mean, they've, they've hardly changed in their appearance since the, they first turned up when the dinosaurs were still around 60 million years ago, um, the earliest primates. And they've, they've really hardly changed at all over, the, over that huge length of time. Whereas, you know, species like uh, um, uh, whales and dolphins have gone from perfectly decent, sensible land living animals to being designed to live in the sea and change completely in, in appearance and so on. Um, you know, the antelope uh, um, uh, deer uh, sort of group again, developing these, these hooved feet for, for running and, and looking very different. So, um, uh, you know, the primate successes come out of the fact that they evolved these highly cooperative social systems that go beyond just the pair, the mating pair. Very often, many of them are um, quite promiscuous in their, in their mating patterns, but the point of their social systems is that it acts as a cooperative um, uh, arrangement for protection against predators, essentially. Uh, and in, in that respect, it's, it's real, realistically, it's an implicit social contract, because if you're going to live in those kind of social systems where everybody sticks together and stays together, you have to be prepared to give up something in order to be part of the group, in order to be uh, uh, able to share in the production, if you like, of the group. Um, this is something that antelope and, and uh, deer, that, that whole group of ungulates, um, don't do. Uh, they live in, on the whole, in these um, rather the ones that live in herds. You know, they're very here today and gone tomorrow. They're often quite anonymous, uh, uh, strangers mix together and separate and then go and mix with other strangers. Whereas primate groups are extremely stable through time. You're particularly for females, very often you're born into it, you die in it uh, at the end of a, a long life. 
Um, so they have that stable call, whereas, you know, herds that you see in the, well, anything from cows to, to deer and antelope, um, you know, are sort of here today and gone tomorrow. They, they, they have the same function because they're a defense against predation, against being caught by predators. Uh, it's there basically just to scare predators off. Um, but they, the, I suppose the problem goes to the fact that if you live in any close proximity to people, and dare I say, it, don't you know it, um, it kind of throws up constant levels of stress. People niggle you, they <laughs> nip your coffee, they you buy them a beer in the pub and they never buy you one. All these kind of... <laughs> minor irritations uh, um, this is primate life and it's it's social life for all you know sophisticated social species they, they all face this problem and and if left to its own devices it would cause the group to disperse uh, because these stresses would just get on top of you uh, and it would be unproductive so so groups would disperse. And that's effectively what's going on in, in herd forming species. They, they clump together when a predator turns up and then gradually as these stresses uh, increase with time um, after the predator has passed by, um, individuals drift away and, and, and the group breaks up and then they'll reform perhaps with some others if, if another predator turns up later. Whereas what primates do is kind of go, well, actually, I don't want to be caught on my own moving between one group and another. Uh, when the one predator is going to come that week turns up. I'd rather have my mates around me all the time because that guarantees um, that I'll always have my defensive coalition. So it's a kind of um, uh, um, a, a fail-safe kind of strategy. It's a risk-averse strategy. I don't want to be caught on my own. So they, the origin of these primate groups is, lies in having these really well-bonded groups to to keep them together. And the bonding is necessary to overcome these stresses because those stresses don't go away. But what you can do is kind of minimize them by um, having these bonded relationships. And part of that is, is the formation of coalitions. So the females in particular, because they're the ones that bear the brunt of uh, these stresses actually, um, form these small coalitions of two or three grooming partners who, who groom very intensely with each other and provide kind of both active and passive protection. So just the fact that, you know, I know that you've got a mate you're always drinking with just discourages me from annoying you too much, right, in the pub, because I know if I annoy you, I'm going to end up having uh, to have an argument with two of you. So it just causes me to back off a little bit. And it's that kind of um, subtle, uh, diplomacy, if you like, uh, of everyday social life that makes primate social groups work the way they do. I, I thought of some of the characteristics of that from a collaboration perspective and that whole idea of not, there's a price to pay for conformity. So you pay a certain price of independence and independent thought in a way. And I, you know, if, if you think of our, our origins on the great savannah, the brain in its current sense, I, my understanding is 200,000 years ago or, or so we were in caves. So that idea of wandering beyond the tribe and breaking the social norms becomes very difficult when I'm bringing it back to innovation here. And if you work in a large, complex bureaucratic organization and you're the person who goes, I oh, will screw the tribe. There's some fresh fruit over here and I'm going to build a new tribe there's a danger and there's a price to pay for that. There is. Um, the problem is that in reality, uh, evolution and everyday life, uh, there is no such thing as the perfect solution to anything. And that's partly because the world we live in is complex. You know, it's, there, there are many things besides just getting enough food in your belly uh, to stay alive that are important uh, in terms of evolution. You know, You've got to feed yourself, yes, but you also have to avoid predators and you have to reproduce successfully. So, you know, minimally, there are kind of three dimensions that you have to satisfy. And it's never possible to satisfy all of those at the same time. You have to kind of go for a, some kind of compromise solution. And, and one consequence of that is there are very often 
alternative ways of achieving the same objective, which work quite well. Uh, they, some may be better in some circumstances, others may be better in, in others. So you kind of alluded to this, I think, in uh, talking about, um, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, sitting in your, your uh, silo, as it were, with, with, with all your friends who, who think exactly like you on the one hand and, and uh, sort of mixing silos to get the benefit of other people's views. Now, both actually work. There are circumstances on, on which, um, you know, having people who are like you um, actually is probably more productive because it, it, it creates fewer stresses and, and tensions in many ways. Um, but it really depends on the size of the organization and the topic, the, the objective of, of, of the organization, if you like. It, it tends to be a small scale thing. And I think that's why family businesses work well at the level that they do. Um, you know, that they're family businesses, but they're quite small. You know, it would be very hard, or is very hard, it seems, to maintain a very large multinational conglomerate as a, as a pure family business. It, um, there are too many lost opportunities you have to be able to well you may have a family that runs it perhaps in in the boardroom but you know the 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 work the, the workplace underneath and particularly the innovations uh, in, in sort of new developments r d people need to probably come from a much wider range of uh, um, uh, backgrounds uh, and uh, disciplines than just your family but family ties work extremely well in in the right place you know the this what's sometimes referred to as the kinship premium is extremely important if you're down on your luck because the only people that are going to come and bail you out when all else fails is close family you know everybody else will abandon you <laughs> <laughs> including the people you thought were your best friends <laughs> Um, and, you know, the only people that will put up with your moaning and groaning and, and uh, um, you know, sort of um, uh, depression or whatever, and, and sort of say, come along here, let's help you out, they're going to be close family. So there are places where choosing the right kinds of people becomes very important. Very often those are people who uh, think like you or have close ties to you and, and both close family, whether you like it or not, do you know tend to think like you they've grown up in the same little subculture as it were so it's it's makes helps make the flow of interactions and so on their uh, contentedness much easier and maybe you don't want that uh, uh, to so much you know if it's in the case of trying to break down the frontiers of innovation because you you really need some left field views coming in at that point and have everybody thinking the same doesn't get you very far and just keep making the old Morris Minor over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> A great car though that was. <laughs> <laughs> and also, well, you know, to your point or your background, have a multi, a polymathic background where you have lots of different disciplines. But I, I think it's a lovely segue for Dunbar's number. And there's a there's a really interesting uh, phenomenon in Japan in particular that they have some of the oldest businesses in the world and so much so that they have a special term for it. it's called Shinese so S-H-I-N-E-S-E -E, and it refers to these businesses that are in some way immortal they keep keep going they don't break down and one of the key ones I thought this was a nice intersection for Dunbar's number and particularly Gore-Tex for example that W.M. Gore business that they keep the numbers low and because of that the you don't get that deterioration or that breakdown in, in social bondedness etc and i thought that would be a lovely way to introduce dunbar's number yes so dunbar's number is really i suppose the limit on the number of functional relationships you can have that's to say relationships which are reciprocal you have the way you feel towards somebody you know they feel back at, at the same level and you both know it um yeah, so these are not kind of one-way relationships they're, they're very much reciprocal and supportive they'll come to your aid when you want it they make up the group of people 
with whom you spend most of your social time, your core social time, as it were. Um, it turns out that number is about 150, give or take a bit. There is, um, according to personality, according to gender, according to age, um, um, and so on. But on average, across the population, across many populations where we've sampled it, uh, it's always about 150. Varies between, from individual to individual, between perhaps 100, let's say for introverts, to about 250 for extroverts, but you know, sort of settling down in this sort of middle range around about 150. Now, it turns out that actually this um, kind of came out of the blue because I was looking at how the size of primate social groups, monkey and ape social groups, related to the size of the brains they had. And there's a very nice relationship between group size and, and brain size in monkeys and apes. So essentially, the bigger the group, the more relationships you have to keep track of the bigger the computer you need, so the bigger the brain. And just idly curious, late one night, probably after a couple too many whiskeys, <laughs> um, I wondered what what it implied for humans. You know, if you plugged human brain sizes into it, what what would it predict for human group sizes? Now came this number 150. It seemed rather low, really, especially as I did this in London. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Might have expected it to be a little bigger. Um, but sure enough, when I um, set about looking for evidence for it in small scale societies, so hunter gatherer societies, which are sort of the kinds of societies, informal egalitarian societies in which we, we humans have spent 99% of our evolutionary history, then this figure of about 150 turns out to be pretty much universal. It's very much the average size of their groups. And since then, lots and lots of other interesting, weird examples uh, have turned up out of the woodwork. It did almost exactly the same thing. And one of them is um, uh, Gore-Tex, the, the Gore-Tex company. And it turns out that when um, Bill Gore was setting up this company, he'd worked for the big American uh, uh, multinational DuPont as a chemist previously for most of his career, he discovered the process that produces the Gore-Tex material. So he set this up as a, 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 sm a small spin-off company of his own and it, literally in his backyard. And he, he was very much struck by when he was working with this huge multinational, just how dysfunctional these big organizations often were, um, that they became highly kind of siloed and you know, with sort of little e echo chambers within the company who never talked with to each other and refused to cooperate with each other and, and you know uh, things would have worked much better and more efficiently if, if they'd all uh, intersected properly but here they were you know the accountants were refusing to talk to the salespeople and the salespeople were refusing to talk to uh, the, the, the people on the factory floor and so on so he decided that this was a problem of scale and that there was a optimal size uh, for a, f a factory unit um, with these, this kind of flow of information around the system and, and, and the sense of obligation and um, trust and willingness to work together um, was at its, it, its peak, if you like, and that this was somewhere around about 150. And this is years before I discovered Dunbar's number. So he really should get the credit. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, but um, uh, he, he has insisted that, or he insisted that the kind of structure of all his uh, factories uh, should be built around this number. So as the business expanded, it's a hugely successful business now. It's one of the most successful kind of medium and sized enterprises uh, in the world. Um, but as the, the sales expanded, rather than expanding the size of the factory, which is of course what every other uh, business does, what he would do is just build a new factory, a completely self-contained factory, sometimes literally on the car park, car parking lot uh, next door. Um, but the two factories would be completely self-contained. So nobody needs t job titles. Everybody knows who the manager of the factory is. They don't have to have a label on his jacket to say manager. Uh, they know that's Jim, you know, and uh, everybody knows who's who's the person who brings the sandwiches around at, at lunchtime and all these kind of things. So don't need special job descriptions and special uniforms. 
because they know them by you know personal uh, interaction and and, and know them per individually and personally and it seems to be a very successful recipe for business organization i really don't understand why lots of others don't follow suit but um, most most businesses are stuck in this kind of hierarchical um, uh, um, um, based almost military based uh, uh, structure of layers and, and uh, you know officers and you know you must salute the officers and all this kind of stuff <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it's it's it is a, a an amazing uh, setup and they still do it i mean uh, will uh, bill um uh, uh uh, Gore is long since dead, but the uh, business is still family run essentially, and they still maintain this organizational structure. They refer to it as the flat lattice uh, organization, which is a very nice description because you have lots of independent little units scattered all over the US, I guess now, um, with a single family, what was essentially a family board sitting above them and and all they were doing were kind of giving each factory their kind of targets to, to have a sort of strategic uh, perception on, on the whole process and then the, it was up to the factories to get on with figuring out how, how, how to meet these and, and as a collaboration as it were between the workforce and the sales teams and the accountants and uh, the, the management and so on so everybody uh, you know has lunch together parties together and away away it goes yeah I, I just thought about it they all know which guy to avoid it doesn't buy you the drink back as absolutely well. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> but uh, I, you know when you think of how large organizations acquire so through m a mer mergers and acquisitions bring in other companies they usually try and then bring them under the the a hierarchical structure and they break down the whole thing and and um it's usually because of economies of scale to try and bring yes. costs down yeah. but there, there was one thing i really found fascinating F firstly for anybody out there the amount of research that backs up these numbers and, and the other thing is to say you didn't call it dunbar's number it was called dunbar's number by other because you kept finding this number ever everywhere in villages yeah. throughout the uk in christmas card lists Everywhere it was in t uh, telephone uh, directories, every everything. But, yes. our, but uh, e even even in the Doomsday Book, for heaven's sake! Wow, I didn't see that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. No. Well, you remember, of course, you know when um, that notorious scumbag William the Conqueror uh, uh, walked into to England and and Wales um, uh, and took them over from their Saxon kings. Um, he had no idea what he'd actually picked up. <laughs> so he thought being, and the Normans were extremely good at administration. That was one of their kind of um, real um, skills, administration organization. So um, he, he said, okay, I need to know what I've got here uh, in order to know how much tax to charge. And so he uh, launched the, the Doomsday Book uh, survey, which is the first sort of major comprehensive civil survey uh, ever done, certainly in Europe, I and mean, they you know, may have uh, 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 done, done them in other empires as it were, but certainly in Europe and certainly in Northern Europe, uh, which enumerated everything. Of course, what they didn't count was people because they weren't interested in people. But every plow, horse, house, field, cow, etc., was enumerated because those are the things you taxed. Um, but the historians have worked out what the village sizes are uh, from, you know, the size of the number of houses and the average number of occupants you'd expect to be in them. And uh, astonishingly, it comes to almost exactly uh, 150 is the average for pretty much every county in England and Wales. It's quite remarkable. Wow, it's a, it's really really fascinating, and, and you know you you go on to talk about it in social media like Facebook and all these kind of things. I think we, we'll we'll put that aside and let people read the book to find that out because there's so much more in this book where you bring in some of your other theories, and one of them that's fascinating was firstly I mentioned purposefully the avoiding Frank, the guy who never buys you the drink back because we have only a certain capacity to remember a certain amount of faces which is important because if you work in a large organization, you, you kind of get, you know, people by their title and not their face. And that has an effect. But the, the really, really fascinating one that I loved, I'd love if you share is the social brain hypothesis. Okay. So the social brain hypothesis uh, is really just 
at root this relationship between social group size and brain size that we find in primates and, and pretty much uniquely in primates. We don't see it in that form in any other groups of birds or mammals. What we, what we find in other groups of birds and mammals is that species that have pair bonded mating systems and particularly stable pair bonded mating systems that last a lifetime have bigger brains than those that live in completely promiscuous mating systems. So think of crows and albatrosses and uh, um, eagles and so on. You know, these are pair bonded species. They all have big brains sitting on top of their modestly little bodies. Whereas things like um, uh, 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 the, the many promiscuous uh, shorebirds and stuff tend to have um, very small brains because you know, there are, it's the cost of maintaining a stable relationship through time. That, that is the problem here. So it's, it's having a big enough computer to manage that. Now, what happens in primates, you almost uniquely have a few other examples where it probably happens as well, but we don't kind of really know enough about them. An obvious one would be elephants, but there are only two species of elephants. Um, but in primates, what you have is this generalization of this pair bonded effect to non reproductive relationships to create friendships embedded within these bonded social groups, which is, you know, how, how, how the social brain hypothesis uh, has its uh, appearance, as it were, in, 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 in primates. Um, but of course, it's, it's not just an issue of memory per se. Yes, you need, do need to be able to remember who is who, and also need, very importantly, to remember who did and who didn't buy you a beer last time down there. <laughs> Um, uh, but, but you have to be able to do a number of other things which are at least as important, probably more important really than, than pure memory. One of them is to be able to understand how somebody else is thinking in order to be able to predict what they're going to do or what they, how they would respond if you did X, Y, and Z, right? Would, would they, you know, sort of give, uh, 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 beat you up for it, or would they, they, they be your best friend afterwards? Um, so you have to be able to predict that and to be able to predict then also what the consequences are for their friends. You know, if, if you start buttering up um, Jim, you know, is uh, Fred going to be outraged because <laughs> you're trying to <laughs> nick his, you know, sort of darts partner or something like that. Uh, it's these quite subtle, um, calculations that we actually do all the time, but they're extremely costly in terms of computing power. And then the other key component is this ability to inhibit what are called prepotent responses. And, and these kind of stable lifelong social systems and lifelong relationships are really totally dependent on, on in many ways on, on this ability to kind of put the lid on your instinctive response to something, you know, so, so that you don't upset the apple cart. So, you know, you, you, you can, rather than grabbing the biggest piece of cake on the plate or indeed the whole cake, uh, you, you just hang back and, and, and allow others to have their share too. You know, that, that kind of thing, not stealing from other people, uh, bearing in mind that they have an interest in, in being part of the community and not their simply for you to exploit. Um, you know, that, that those forms of implicit cooperation are really critical to these uh, stable bonded social groups, the kinds we find in, in monkeys and apes and, and especially humans. And indeed, across monkeys, their ability to inhibit um, these prepotent responses, as it were, improves as their brain size uh, increases. So they've got those two very important components. And then if you like at the cognitive end and then underpinning them and providing some of the kind of mechanisms to allow these things to work together is a whole nother layer uh, in the kind of pharmacology of it all that particularly involves the, the uh, uh, neuropeptides that are known as endorphins, which are a part of the pain management system in the brain, They're incredible little molecules. Um, that turn up all over the place in many different contexts, but their main function is, is as part of the pain management system because they're opiates. The name 
endorphin is a contraction of endogenous morphine. Um, endogenous meaning the brain's own mm. uh, morphine because chemically they're very, very similar to morphine. But there are, the differences are small, but enough that we don't get addicted to them in the destructive way we get addicted to morphine and other, uh, uh, other opiates. As it were. So what these do is create this sense of kind of relaxation. That's the opiate effect of warmth, of trustingness, of contentedness of happiness um, with whoever you're doing these core activities uh, that we engage in in the social world. And, and in particular for monkeys and apes, that's social grooming. That's how they bond their, their friendships, how they create and maintain their friendships. So uh, the, the more time you spend grooming, the more you trigger the endorphin system. And it, it there's a specialized neural system from the skin that only deals with that all it responds to light slow stroking at exactly two and a half centimeters a second slower or faster there's no effect it's the speed of grooming and it still works with us uh, that's you know why you uh, give people hugs and put an arm around their shoulder and a pat on the back and all these kind of things that we do with our closer friends and, and relations um, but what we've done has been to find other mechanisms that or other behaviors that trigger the endorphin system in contexts where we don't physically have to touch somebody. So the constraint of grooming is it's very much a one-on-one, -on -one. it's a very intimate one-on-one -on -one activity. So there's an upper limit uh, because the strength of a friendship, the strength of a relationship uh, <clears throat> depends totally on how much grooming you do with that individual that limits the, the size of groups you can live in. When, during the course of our evolution, when we wanted to increase our group size from the sort of normal maximum we find in monkeys and apes, which is about 50 on average, is the, the largest groups we find in monkeys and apes. Um, <clears throat> when we want to push, push that group size up towards Dunbar's number, we had to find other ways to, in effect, groom virtually with uh, more individuals that we could Kind of increase the size of the group and what we've done is is lit on um, uh, um, historically really a number of behaviors that turn out to have this property and, and in order of which probably we acquired them um, their laughter which probably is pretty ancient <coughs> indeed we share laughter with the great apes well it's in a slightly adapted form in, in humans um, singing dancing the rituals of religion, uh, uh, feasting, um, so eating in itself, eating socially, alcohol, drinking alcohol, and particularly drinking alcohol socially is an extremely good um, trigger of the endorphin system. Um, uh, uh, telling emotional sob stories, uh, highly emotional stories, yeah, these are all very good. Uh, storytelling kind of in general, um, all, all seem to be extremely effective triggers uh, of the endorphin system and allow us to do it because we don't have to touch the other person. We, we can do it with more individuals at the same time. So we can kind of use our time more efficiently, if you like, to increase the size of the group. And laughter is a kind of good example of that because remember, grooming is a one-on-one -on -one thing. It's still a one-on-one -on -one thing with us. I invite you to test this by, um, taking a couple of other people to the, 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 the cinema uh, on uh, whatever, when we can go to cinemas again <laughs> um, and sitting in the back row with them, one on either side and try cuddling with both of them. And I can bet you within 10 minutes, one of them will have walked out in a huff because you've not been paying them enough attention. Wow. Right? Very intimate kind of focused one-on-one -on -one thing. Um, and, and what laughter does is generalize that. So what happens with laughter um, is we have a little uh, group of people that we will laugh with. In, um, in fact, it's about three, three to four people is really the upper limit on a, uh, a laughter group. It's the same size as a conversation group. But what's interesting about that, uh, so although there are uh, two or three other people who you're making laugh by telling your witty joke, you also laugh as part of this. So it, it, bearing in mind that in grooming, it's only the person being groomed that gets the opiate high. Uh, in laughter, all of you get the opiate high, including the groomer, because uh, you all laugh. And it's these kind of relaxed, 
contented belly laughing, if you like, that really <laughs> triggers the endorphin system like crazy. Of course, you know, think of music and singing, then it's unlimited. And there you are on the football terraces or the shinty terraces or whatever it may be, the rugby terraces. And, you know, you could all burst into communal song. And, and it really is a very, very bonding process for, you know, several thousand people at the same time. Well, on your side, anyway. <laughs> I, I heard once that endorphins are so endorphins came from the whole idea of you have to get up in the morning and go and hunt your food. So they're released in the body to to quell the pain in the way. And that when you laugh, then it's it's there's a rattle on your on your internal organs. So your body thinks you're under attack. So it releases the endorphin. And um, I thought of it, it, you know, from a, a social bonding perspective, like a neurochemical carrot to go, you're supposed to be together, you're supposed to collaborate and work together. And yeah. as you say, in the book, it's way less demanding to go and wonder, is this fruit ripe or go and look for new berries over there than it is to actually interact with with a tribe of people. And I say that to say, let's talk quickly about because I know you're under time pressure about uh, the whole idea of how the longevity of life and the happiness of life when you do have friends, because it's something that sometimes we neglect in the pursuit of a vision like work or writing books or whatever. Sometimes we neglect those people that that we really, truly need later in life. This is true. And I think this is and this partly goes back to what the value of having friends is now. OK, the story we've we've worked our way around so far has largely been in terms of creating groups. But remember that to create those groups, what happens is we create these small subsets of individuals that we groom a lot with or interact a lot with that act as coalitions that buffer us against the stresses of living in these big groups. They just keep everybody kind of off our backs a little bit uh, so we don't suffer so much from those stresses. Now, that, that little subgroup of friends, which typically will be about five people, usually split half and half between family, close family and close friends. Um, they are, those five people account for 40 percent of our total social time investment, our emotional investment, our social capital, if you like. Uh, we, we invest very, very heavily in them. And it turns out that they have huge additional benefits for our psychological well-being and our physical health, even our longevity. So one of the surprises from the epidemiological literature, the medical literature from the last 10, maybe 15 years only, has been this sort of positive tsunami of publications showing that the best predictor of how many, how happy you are, how uh, physically healthy you are, um, how your ability to um, uh, recover from major surgery, even your risk of dying, are affected by the number and quality of uh, um, uh, those close friends, that, that close friendship circle. Um, and there's huge quantity of data. We're uh, just publishing a paper just now, um, uh, some massive sample of I don't know, 130,000 people surveyed across uh, half a dozen European countries, um, looking at um, uh, the risk of um, depression and um, the risk of depression is much lower the more friends you have. Um, now, it, it, there isn't a kind of, well, there is an optimal size because the problem is you have to invest a lot of time in each of those friendships to make it work in this kind of way. So there is a limit and that limit is about five. But, you know, we can choose a little bit um, in, in terms of what works best for you. So introverts will perhaps have, you know, three or four best friends, whereas extroverts might, might have uh, five or six, that kind of range of variation. So, you know, the fact that you have less than five needn't be a bad thing, let's put it this way. They're still doing the same job for you because it's just the dynamics of how the relationships work that, that really is the only difference. Um, but but the, the, the effect that those have is it, it, on your both your mental well-being, your risk of dementia in the future in old age, um, as well as your risk of uh, 
physical diseases, um, certain physical diseases, um, particularly the ones that have a long, slow onset. So you know, uh, the, the fast onset diseases, like liver cancer is a particular example, it tends to be very quick. Um, it has no, these effects don't appear at all in, in that context, but, but things like heart, heart, heart conditions and, and, and so on. The number of friends you have actually is the best thing you can do uh, in terms of um, uh, ensuring that you live as long as you possibly can with this condition. Um, and and in, in the studies that have been done of this, um, you know, the, the number of and quality of friendships you have uh, for, for heart attack patients, and they're measuring, you know, the, the chances of surviving the next 12 months after that first heart attack. That's their very, very sharp uh, uh, measure, if you like. It's very hard nosed. Um, you know, the best predictor is the number and quality of friends you have. And then a little way behind that is giving up smoking. And a long way behind comes everything else that your doctor usually worries about, namely, what pills are you on? How overweight are you? Uh, what exercise regime are you on? Uh, you know, what do you eat? What's the air quality in your, your, your neighborhood? All these things, of course, they all have an effect, a small effect, but it's much, much smaller than just having good friends. The difficulty, of course, is you can't just magic friends up out of nowhere and suddenly decide the day you get your heart attack, I'd better go and make some friends. It doesn't work that way. You have to have these friends there and already part of your social network before the heart attack comes. So uh, take my advice and start now building. <laughs> I thought of it that the cognitive energy is important because you know you get this dynamic when people first start going out with the opposite sex and the friends start giving out and going, we never see Robin anymore. Not since he started going out with that Mary and everybody starts arguing, yeah. but it's that it, that's why, because you don't actually have the cognitive energy to give to those people. And, and it's a, just a time thing. Uh, you know, the, the, the sheer investment of time I and mean, speaking of these romantic relationships reminds me of the one study we did, which looked at the size of that close inner circle of five, optimally five best friends. Um, and uh, we asked people who, who completed this survey to say whether they were in a, 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 a romantic relationship or not. And I'd say a, a kind of the early phases of a romantic relationship, you know, the first decade, let's say, uh, when it's still exciting and stuff like that. <laughs> um, and I, I, I mean, this is actually a complete accident because this, I don't know even why we put the question in, but when we looked at the data, what just astounded us was the fact that yes, everybody who was declared that they weren't in a new and uh, invigorating romantic relationship had the conventional five uh, best friends and, uh, and close family uh, in that circle. And this is defined as, we define this circle as the, the group of people you would go to, it's your support clique, go to for emotional, social, financial, economic, whatever support when your world falls apart. You know, how many people do you feel you can count on that would at the drop of a hat, you know, um, come and kind of bail you out and, uh, and chivvy you along. But people who are in an active romantic relationship only had four. Um, so uh, the, the, the bad message here is, is that uh, falling in love loses you friends. And the bad, bad news is it actually loses you two friends. If you just think about what's going on here, you've got, you, you arrive at this point where you first meet Mary with five close friends and family. Uh, um, uh, you invest so much time in Mary uh, that you, you end up having to then sacrifice your friendships with somebody else. And, and, and that's because you've actually pushed that layer up to six. So it's the original five plus Mary, and now Mary's taking up two lots of time, right? Uh, of your two units of your time. So uh, uh, what has actually happened is you've given up two friendships for the sake of your romantic re relationships. You know, it just shows how um, how much how importantly we regard our romantic relationships. We're prepared to pay this enormous price. What's even kind of more amusing in many ways is remember this is sort of. That, that layer of, in a layer of five best friends is 
sort of two friends, two family, and one one or the other to make up the number. And you kind of go, well, who do you give up? Do you, if you're going to have to sacrifice two, do you give up your two friends? You don't go drinking with them anymore. Or do you give up your two close members of your family? Now, there are kind of trade-offs here because, you know, um, at the end of the day, family, you don't want to sacrifice them completely because they're the people who are going to bail you out when everything else falls apart in your life. You know, you need to keep them in, in the loop. Um, but on the other hand, you know, w when you go along and uh, uh, say, um, you know, oh, she, 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 you know, she's deserted me, she's abandoned me and, and, and left me and I'm, I'm really miserable. Uh, you know, family are inclined to say, well, we never liked her much anyway. <laughs> This is not what you want to hear. <laughs> the only people that are going to do the right thing, which is a hug around the shoulder or take you out for a beer, are the friends. So you don't want to abandon your friends either. Um, and in fact, what we do is we let one family member go and one friend go. So we keep one of each as our um, kind of fail safe. It's really subtle. It's absolutely fascinating. Robin, can I, have you time for one more question? On yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go Brilliant. On. Okay, because I I think firstly I was thinking when you were saying that about I found out that the hard way because I had a very small wedding below fifty people <laughs> and I had to cut some people. So we all learn that way when we come to the wedding list. But yeah. the, the it gets me onto gender because I when there's a lot of talk about diversity, particularly at the moment, and it's in innovation in particular, like you've talked about earlier on it's neurodiversity it's how we think and, right. and i think this is so often overlooked when we talk about diversity but gender does have an effect on how we think and i thought it was fascinating that you shared how women have more friends is one thing they spend longer on the phone and use technology more to connect with those friends which was fascinating and then if you think back to the origins of that they had to maintain the tribe, the cohesiveness of the tribe. And there wasn't that male ego testosterone driven competition for who was the alpha male at the top of the tribe. Right. Yeah. I, I, and I think, um, you know, this, obviously there's been a, you know, 50 odd years or maybe much longer of sort of um, hand wringing and angst about um, uh, gender differences, uh, mainly focused on IQ. Um, where there are very few differences. Uh, um, it would be very surprising if there were, there were a lot um, uh, of any significance. Um, but what's been kind of overlooked, I think, is the fact that men and women live in very, very different social worlds. Now, that may be very relevant in some businesses and completely irrelevant in others. You might imagine that in innovation, it kind of doesn't really... Uh, make a lot of difference the social those kind of social aspects of the thing so much as the kind of intellectual uh, side that you can bring bring to the, the 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 workplace but there may be other areas of work or, or life where and one might think of um, for example with the health service in particular um, you know where women may just be much better at uh, uh, dealing with the kinds of approaching the problems that, that need to be solved because they're social problems, they're, they're, uh, if you like, human problems, and they're just much better at that than men are. And, it, and this goes back to the fact that um, if you look at the dynamics of how men and women uh, maintain their uh, friendship circles, they're really extraordinarily different. Um, uh, you know, men's relationships, friendships tend to be very casual and here today and gone tomorrow. Um, and many wives have expressed deep frustration, I know, <laughs> because they, you know, they will say to their husbands, well, you know, you haven't contacted Jimmy, who you, know, you, 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 you spent your entire childhood playing football with. Why don't you give him a ring? And the response is usually a blank look and a shrug and, oh, well, you know, maybe tomorrow, but not today. Whereas women will be on the phone to kind of keep those relationships going uh, all the time. Um, and it is kind of um, um, a, 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 a amusing in many ways that, you know, technology, uh, and particularly digital technology, everything from the phone to Facebook, which are largely invented by, by blokes because they're techie things, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the ones doing the techie things, at least at the time. 
but they've been much more heavily exploited by women than, than, than by men in this social domain. Um, you know, so and, and sort of in the in the the more general sense of you know of texting. You know, here's this thing facility that was introduced into mobile phones by some uh, uh, imaginative techie uh, uh, somewhere in in Silicon Valley who thought it might want, perhaps be useful. You know, that the railway company could uh, <laughs> send you a text to say your train is late because the you know wrong leaves were on the line and uh, it's been slowed down or whatever. And they never imagined that it would be used as a social tool, you know, and okay, it's quite useful and people do, you know, uh, have uh, notifications sent to them about <laughs> whether their train is going to be early or late or what have you, but it's far more heavily used, far, far more heavily used for uh, um, uh, social relationships and social exchanges um, than anything. <laughs> anything that I'm sure the original designers ever had in mind. In fact, they, you know, they, it had happened very quickly as well. I mean, within six months, people were using that facility for, for these social texting. Um, uh, and it took the, the entire <laughs> mobile phone industry completely by surprise. They just <laughs> never imagined it. Uh, but, you know, this sort of... Um, uh, 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 differences between men's and women's social world is really built around uh, the way in which the two sexes bond with each other. And it's just very different. In, in women, it's very, very conversationally based. Uh, and they're picking up huge amounts of information from uh, um, what's going going on in, in, in other people's lives. So that, and this kind of allows them to kind of keep the wheels of the social network well oiled and ticking over and working. Um, and and they, will, they will remember things which uh, blokes, you know, who were there at the time, classic is, again, I've heard several people comment on this, you know, a couple will be at a dinner party and, 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 and the wife will come away with, you know, complete knowledge of everybody's children and what they're doing and their aunties and their uncles and their grandparents and what have you. And they'll mention to us the husband, who was at the same conversation and he'll sit there and look blankly at her and go, what? We never talked about any of that. <laughs> Their relationship's in trouble. I can see it. You're like, oh, what? Well, yes, I mean, but this is, <laughs> this, is, this is, if you like, this is, um, this is an example of, uh, of having a mix of, uh, of um, uh, disciplinary strategies. Yeah. <laughs> like, to, that makes the, the, the thing, the thing, the relationship as a whole, Tick, however frustrating it may be at times, um, but you know, but for blokes, it's actually doing stuff together. And they, we looked at what prevents relationships decaying over time um, uh, when people move away from from where they were living, so they can't see their old friends very easily. And and you know, for women, the whether the friendship survived and continued to be valued, if you like, and maintained, depended dramatically on how much time, extra time they devoted to trying to keep track by phone, by Facebook, Skype or whatever. Whereas conversation had absolutely zero effect on, on, on the guy's relationships at, at all. What made the difference was taking the time to get together and do stuff. Now do stuff might be, you know, sort of joining the fiver side football every Friday night or going down to the pub for a beer or climbing a mountain or, you know, canoeing around uh, 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 the whole of Ireland, you know, whatever your sport or activity or it might be stamp collecting, or going to do train spotting, or, you know, it doesn't really matter what the activity is. It's better if there's some physical component to it because that triggers the endorphin system. Now. But it's just doing stuff. And I have this kind of vision of what boys and men's relationships are really like with that. There's a famous photograph you often see examples of two old Greek men uh, sitting in the sunshine outside a, a, a taverna with a, uh, uh, either side of a table and they never speak to each other and occasionally they sip their ruzo or a glass of wine or something. Now that's boys bonding. <laughs> Nothing happens, nothing is done, but they're bonding, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. And, you know, I thought one final kind of uh, get, a, get a little bit of a belly laugh and endorphin for our audience was the 
telephone data on how long we spent on the phone. This is true, yes. I mean, there's always, I've often made a joke out of this and said, you know, sort of um, this perhaps ex the, 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 the fact that conversation, as it were, talking together is what maintains and, and, and services uh, women's relationships. That's what, how they work. Um, is reflected in the fact that, you know, 14, 15, 16 year olds will get home from school and then the girls will be on the phone for an hour to the people they've spent all day <laughs> with. Whereas you're jolly lucky if you can get seven and a half seconds out of a boy on, on, on the phone. And I always maintain this is because boys have nothing to talk about on the phone except. I'll see you down the pub at seven. <laughs> That's all you need to say. Because, you know, talking together really doesn't do anything for them. It's, it's actually doing stuff together, banging their heads together, if you like, that, that, that is the way they want. Um, and I, I used to sort of give that as a kind of joke, if you like, and, uh, but it did prompt us to actually look when we, we got hold of one of the big national, uh, not I hasten to, to say, um, uh, 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 um, uh, an Irish or a British uh, telephone, national telephone. <laughs> <laughs> so you're all safe there. <laughs> <It's> all <right. laughs> the records are safe. <laughs> but from another European country. And um, there it was. I mean, it wasn't quite as exaggerated as that. But you know, girl, girls, if I remember that rightly, girls' uh, phone calls were about twice as long on average as, as boys were. And especially so if, uh, late at night. And they were calling... A boy. Oh, right. okay. And Are the boy's I, kind of going, can we just meet up? Um, I, yeah. I thought, you know. My, my advice, my advice, I, mean, I, I emphasize the A boy, right? Because it's, it's very specific. My, my, my advice is if she calls you at midnight and is on the phone for, for an hour, it is serious. Just pick <laughs> up and sniff the coffee. <laughs> Brilliant. And, you know, Robin, I, I was just going to say the, the depth and breadth of your work is so refreshing to read everything and what what i really think is so important is those things i mentioned about diversity and the understanding and the empathy that you know they say men are from venus women from mars whatever that was we right. have different brains we, ha we have different brains uh, we operate differently and when you understand that you can kind of take pause and say and go, i'm not going to judge i'll take a step back and it's the same then with collaboration and diversity and organizations that you kind of go, we, we actually need this in order to survive with the rate of change and the amount of data coming down the line. We need everybody to act as sensors and we need their brains to be safe and feel psychologically safe so they can absorb that data. But it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I've been chasing you for a very long time. And I, to our audience, I highly recommend reading anything by Robin. I have behind me a couple of books here, Evolutionary Psychologies there and The Science of Love and Betrayal. I have loads more in my Kindle here beside me. And the latest book is this book, Friends. It's the culmination of so much, so many of your lenses, Robin, all coming together to give us this new gift that you've given us. And I know there's many more in the way. It's been fascinating chat an honor to speak to you and i know we're hoping to have a chat in the new year um maybe a, a, an intersections chat uh, hopefully we can bring that together yourself and robert sapolsky it's been a pleasure speaking to you robin dunbar thank you for joining us a pleasure